This morning I need several helpers, actually like eight people. So if you think you're pretty good at trivia or just general knowledge, I need three people just pretty good at trivia, general knowledge, first three hands, or I have to come out and recruit people. Um, uh, come on up, Lisa, you're one of them. Uh, uh, let's see, all right, Jenna, come on down, and Ron, all right, Ron's gonna come on down. So you three are gonna stand over here, uh, and then I need uh, somebody who's really good at math, a math person, all right, Vinny, come on down. I need someone who's good at sewing, uh, a seamstress type person, sewing, anybody good at sewing here? Someone who does a lot of sewing. Where's, is Lou here? She's not here. All right, Karen, you're gonna have to come. Uh, all right, um, I need somebody who is good at like government history. Government history. Mr. Jo Mr. All right, Mr. Schmidt, come on down. He teach this, teaches this stuff. Let's see, I, I also need somebody who is good at, uh, um, let's see, woodworking. Anybody good at woodworking? Roger, you want to come on down? Come on down, Roger. You can, you can help us out with the woodworking. And then uh, sports. Who is like really? Brandon? All right. Come on down. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a little competition. Um, so you all over here, uh, we need three, three of these pads. So just grab a, here's one. Uh, Brandon, you're over with the team. These guys are working independently because they think they're really smart. So, uh, no, no, no. You are independent. You are competing against one another here, okay? So that is, that is, that is how this rolls. You are all working together as a team. You can collaborate, okay? And so I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Um, we're going to have you take a step forward for every time you get a right answer, and then we'll, that'll be kind of how we gauge whether... You're, so you may want to like line up so you can walk this way. And then uh, we'll just keep track of how many answers you guys get right, you know, if you miss one as a team together, okay? So here we go. Question number one. We're going to start with the sewing questions, okay? You have to write your answers down first. Uh, and then you all, can you all can collaborate, okay? So what type of sewing machine would you use to close an afraid edge of material? Okay? Afraid edge of material, what type of sewing machine would you use? Three, two... One, you have your answers written down. Okay, what do you have? I think it's a serger. Serger is correct. No, I said a singer. A singer, wrong. Nothing. Nothing, okay, so Lisa, take a step forward. Uh, yeah, I, knew that Karen, I knew that Karen knew that answer, so uh, we have, we're good over here. All right, number two, what is the name of the tool used for taking apart stitches in a hem? Three, two, one. All right, your answers should be written down. This is a fast quiz. You have anything? Not Nothing. Knowing. ID hammer. A D hammer? No. I, I'm calling it a hem ripper. A seam ripper. Seam ripper. No good. Um, <laughs> all right, number three. What direction should the fabric face when sewing two pieces together? When you're sewing two pieces of fabric together, what, what direction should the, should the fabric face? Okay. Three, two, one, zero. Okay, answer. Still got nothing. Nothing? Nothing for this. East, wrong. <laughs> uh, facing each other. Facing each other is correct. Yes, all right. Karen, I asked Karen all the answers to these questions, so. Um, what is a bobbin? Three, two, one. Your answer should be written down. Okay. It holds thread on the sewing machine? Where? Like on the top? Wrong! I said it's a thing of a bob. A thing of a bob. I'll give you half a step for that one. A bobbin is, holds the underneath thread. Underneath yes, the yes, yes. Yes, okay. And again, Karen knew that. Okay, when sewing a pair of jeans... Would you use a 10 or a 16 gauge needle? So you have a 50-50 chance here. 10 or 16 gauge needle. Which one would you use for sewing a pair of jeans? I'm guessing on this one. All right. All right. What do, what do we have over here? 16. 16? Oh, 16. If you have 16, you got it right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Take a step forward. Okay. Now we're moving, we're moving into what I call lane two questions. Okay. These are questions about sports. Okay. So uh, you may want to get your sports person here. How many people from one team are allowed on the field at the same time in football? Uh -oh. How many people can play, uh, are allowed on the team, are on the field at one time in football, okay? Three, Wait, or just from, one team? from one team, from one team. Three, two, one, okay, what do you have? 12. 12, 11, 11. 21, I'm probably way off. 21, the correct answer is 11, okay. Um, okay. Uh, number two, uh, how long is a regulation soccer game? 
regulation soccer game. We're not talking overtime. We're just talking regulation soccer game. I know many of you are soccer people. Well, yeah, so, <laughs> all right, what do you have? I feel like it's like 45 minutes or something. No. It's not 90. 90 is, 90. is and, and did you guys have 90? Okay, okay, okay. I should ask you guys first. Um, all right, um, let's see. Number, th number three, how far from the basket is the three-point line from in high school basketball? It's measured from the center of the basket. How far from the basket is the three-point line in high school basketball? Not college or NBA, but high school. High school. You got a basketball coach over here. If he doesn't know this, we're all going to be like, ah! I know how long from a foul shot, but I don't know. Oh, the three-point line. That's what everybody wants to know anyways, right? All right, what's our answer? 18 and a half. No! Oh, man. I'm saying 12. 12, no. 18? It's actually 19 and a half. 19 and a half feet. They were close. Uh, Nice try. Uh, all right. When the count is two and one, how many balls has a pitcher thrown to a batter? If the count is two and one, how many balls has he thrown to that particular batter? Okay. One. Two. Two. The answer is two. Oh, man. I'll give you a stop for that one. Wow. It, the correct answer that I was looking for was two. Balls and strikes, but Mr. Uh, playing around the words here, wordsmith. All right, all right, here's our last sports question. Into what time frame is hockey, a hockey game divided? Into what time frame? Is it periods, quarters, uh, rounds, halves? Uh, what is hockey? The time that hockey is divided into is what? Periods. 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 Everybody got that right? Okay, all right. All right, now we're moving into our history questions. So uh, here we go. Uh, who was the 16th president of the U.S.? <laughs> 16th president of the U.S. Three, two, one. Your time is up. And the correct answer is? Lincoln. Lincoln. If you had Lincoln, Lincoln, you get to take a step forward. All right. How many senators, this is easy, how many senators does each state send to, the, send to Congress? How many senators, I tried to make these easy. All right. What the answer is? Two. 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 Everybody have two? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, who wrote the Federalist Papers? Oh, a little harder one now. Who wrote the Federalist Papers? Adams? There's three possibilities. All right, we've got Adams. I put John Adams. I put Hamilton, Madison. I was trying to think of the other one. Actually, Adams is not correct. Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay are the correct uh, answers. Uh, Take a step forward. Uh, uh, How many terms was FDR elected to the U.S. presidency for? FDR. How many terms did FDR get elected for? How many? Four. 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 Everybody have four? Oh, man. All right, here's our last uh, history question. In what branch of government did Thurgood Marshall serve? Oh, I know this one. Oh, I know this one. Everybody should know this one. Eighth, Eighth grade social studies. Judicial. Who, judicial, yes. Supreme Court, judicial. Supreme Court, judicial. Supreme Court is not a branch of government. The judicial is the branch of government. So I will not accept Supreme Court, even though it is. It's fine. I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. All right. Here's some math questions. How many sixteenths is three quarters? How many sixteenths is three quarters? Three, two, one. Time? Twelve is the correct answer. Okay. All right. What is the sum of, here, here you go really quick. What is the sum of eight, fifteen, four, and two? Eight, fifteen, four, and two. Eight, fifteen, four, and two. Time is up. Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Ah. All right, 29 is the correct answer. All right, uh, what does PEMDAS stand for? What is PEMDAS? What is PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S? What does PEMDAS stand for? Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Yes. No. Common course. <laughs> That's common course. All right, okay, I learned that when I was in school and there was no common course. All right, um, how many degrees are there inside a quadrilateral? Degrees inside a quadrilateral. Three, two, one. Correct answer? 360. 360. 360. Our math man is failing us. Ah! We should put Ron on the regular team and put Vinny over here on the <laughs> do-it-yourself team. All right, all right how, uh, what do you call lines that form a T? Lines that form a T. How would we describe them? What would the wor geo. one word that we would have to describe lines that form a T? All right, what is the correct perpendicular. answer? Perpendicular is the correct answer. Is that what you guys had? Okay, we'll trust you. All right, all right here's, some, here's some woodworking questions. Uh, so get your woodworking expert. 
All right. Uh, what wood is harder, cedar or maple? What? Which, which word is, or which wood is harder, cedar or maple? How many people said maple? I maple <laughs> is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, what special cut can a compound miter saw accomplish? What special cut can a compound miter saw accomplish? Like, what would you cut with a compound miter saw? Roger probably can't hear me. <laughs> I didn't think you could. I'm just going to go straight up right now. I don't know. Say a corner. A corner? No, you can't cut. A, you can't cut a corner. What does a compound miter saw cut? 40 angles. It can cut two angles uh, uh, by a double angle cut at the same time. Did no, it's not, right? it's, it's not a corner. <laughs> you were talking it could cut like two different directions at the same time. No. All right. The, the big team gets it. Uh, what type of nail would you use to attach wood veneer to a piece of MDF? Trick question. Shh. This is like Jeopardy. Would the audience please be quiet? Those of you out there. You heard, or what do you have? I, I'm just going with a regular nail. A regular a nail? Question. Liquid nails. Liquid nails? I'm saying finishing nail. Finishing nails? You would not use a nail. You would glue it, right? Oh. Is that what liquid nail is? Yeah, I'll give you liquid nails. Okay. Even though, there we go. like you would not typically use liquid nail. Way too thick. You'd have to use a different type of nail. Take a step back. You, that's not unacceptable. <laughs> so All right. Bad. What would you use a biscuit or a domino for in a wood project? What would you use a biscuit or a domino for in a wood project other than to uh, play or eat? I think I got this. All right. Uh, what do we have? What's the, what's the correct answer? That's two pieces. All right. For joining two, yep, joining two pieces. Space. All right. Ron's right. So you, you, use it, you put it in between the wood, and it keeps the wood from spreading like this. All right. All right here's, here's our last question. Okay. Let's do it. What is thicker, 12-gauge or 14-gauge wire? Yeah. Everybody put down 12? All right, 12, 12 is the correct answer. <laughs> Ron, you need to take bigger steps, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so um, if, we were to, if we were to have had the regular team, the full team taking steps forward the whole time, I think they would have uh, like passed the end of the church by this point. Like they totally got more right than, than our uh, individual people, right? But there was a reason for that, right? Because they could lean into each other. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Uh, no, you can keep, your, keep that for a momentum. It's a free gift from us this morning. Thank you for your participation. Uh, prizes will not be awarded, but uh, we do thank you for your time. So all of that to illustrate this morning uh, what our text is going to talk about as we turn to Acts chapter 6. Last week, we left off with... Uh, the apostles having shared the gospel and getting into trouble for sharing the gospel, and, and yet they came to this realization that they had to keep talking, right? Like they could not stop talking about the wonderful things that they had seen and heard Jesus do. They, it was too good to keep inside. They couldn't stop talking. And so they committed to continue to share the message, even though there was some opposition, even though there were people that were pushing against them and saying, no, you should not be doing this. And so we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 6 in verse 1 this morning. But as the believers rap rapidly multiplied, so the result of, of them continuing to t talk and to share the message and to celebrate what God was doing and to share the love of Christ and the grace of Christ with others was that the church began to con or continued to rapidly grow, right? So there's rapid growth and expansion in the life of the church. As the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of the food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, We apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, let's select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. And then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. And everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, 
Parmenas and Nicolas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. And these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Let's pray. God, this morning as we look into this passage of Scripture just a little bit, I pray that you would uh, challenge us to see what our part is as we think about the ministry here at Orchard Park Wesleyan Church and that we might find our lane and then run in it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the church was growing because the apostles were continuing to share the love of Jesus Christ. And the result of the growth was that there were additional needs created in the church. Right? Like so as new people came in, there were, there were new needs that began to develop. And, and people began to uh, be overlooked and to fall through the cracks and to be missed because there was so much activity and so much excitement and so many people coming to the ministry of the early church. And so when people get overlooked and start falling through the cracks and, and, and there's needs that are going unmet, what happens? Well, people begin to grumble a little bit, like, wait a minute, I, why, aren't, why aren't my needs important? And why are people not uh, paying attention to what's going on in my life or helping me in this situation? And, and so that grumbling created a response from the apostles to say, wait a minute, we, need, we don't want to miss anybody. We don't want people to feel like they're uncared for. We don't want people to fall through the cracks. So how do we remedy this? And and they said, we need help. We can't do this all on our own. We need help. The growth of the church, the expansion of the ministry, created a need for help. And you know what? The same is true today. God's church is not designed to be run by paid clergy. It's not designed to be run by a small staff. It's designed to be a community working together, using their gifts and their resources and their talents so that everybody is being ministered to, so that nobody is falling through the cracks and everybody has a chance to use their gifts. We need your help. We need your help. We need people who are willing to come alongside of us and to help us. Hit the next slide. You see, as we fulfill our mission, as, as we continue to grow, as we continue to reach out, right, and, and to share the extraordinary life of Christ with other people, and people are attracted to that and they respond to that, we need you to help us to care for one another, to care for new people, to care for people in our community. We need your help. We all want people to share life together, to, to get close to and to walk the journey of life, right? Like, and we as a pastoral staff love diving into your lives and walking with you, and, and we do that in, in various ways, but you know, we can't be there at every moment and every time and every place for every person. It's impossible, right? Like if we have a church of 20, then yeah, we, you can do that. But we don't have a church of 20. God has blessed us. And so we need you. We need you to partner with us. We need you to come alongside of people and to love on people and to share in their life and to lift them up and to help carry their burdens, to walk with them. And so one of the things that, that our leadership team is talking about is is how, how can we do a better job of this in our congregation? How can we help people in our congregation know that they are loved for and cared for? Not just by the pastors, but by the whole church. And so we're working right now on a strategy, uh, a plan to help increase our, our level of care amongst the congregation. But you know what that plan is dependent on? It's depending on you saying yes. I'll live into somebody else's life. I'll let God's love flow through me into the life of somebody else in the church. I'll be an agent of grace that shares the resources God has blessed me with, that steps into those opportunities that God puts in front of me. I'll be a person who says yes to sharing in the ministry. And so as we think about 
getting ready to serve, there are a couple things that we need to, need to also be preparing ourselves for. And so the, apostle, uh, the apostles recognized three qualities that they were looking for in people who were going to partner in the ministry. The first thing that they were looking for was somebody who was well-respected. I think of people who are well-respected in terms of character, right? Like character, people who have strong character. And so when we, uh, when we step into service, we're also making a commitment to say, I'm going to be growing in my character. I'm going to be allowing God to transform me on the inside. You see, if, if you are refusing God's transforming power at work on your insides, as you step into character, what do you do? You bring all of your, your, your baggage and, and, and stuff that you're working with and refusing to let God change, and you dump that on somebody else. And that's not healthy. But if you're allowing God to change you on the inside, if you're allowing God to shape your character, then when we live into somebody else's life, even though we all have baggage and things that we're struggling with, when we bring them, uh, because, and we all bring them with us, we can't help that, but when we bring those things with us, what do, they, what do people see? They see how God is changing us and, in, and, and building our character and transforming us into people who look like Jesus more and more each day. You see, they get to see God's transforming power at work in us. And so one of the criteria for people who are going to help in service is that they are allowing God to change them on the inside. There are people who say, I want to be, I want to have the character of Christ. And the only way that that is possible is if God is going, if I allow God to change me. If I'm willing to grow in character. Last night, Paul Markell was sharing at the celebration in Hamburg of his experience when they planted the church 60 years ago. And when God first began to move in Pastor Paul's heart, he, he, he made this statement. He said, I wasn't really willing to do what God was asking me to do. And his prayer was, Lord, I give you permission to make me willing. I'm willing to make, for you to make me willing. You see, that's a person who's letting God shape their character. Who's letting God say, I'm willing for you to change me on the inside. I'm willing for you to change my heart, my thinking. But the apostles didn't just look for people of character. They secondly, they looked for people who were full of the spirit. When I think of people who are full of the spirit, I think of people who are growing in faith who are willing to, to trust God when it doesn't always logically add up. Right? Who are willing to take a risk for God. Who are willing to say yes to those big things that God puts on our heart. And, and, and we're like, Lord, I don't think I can do that. But yet we know that God has called us to that. These are people who are willing to say, I'll risk it for Jesus. I'll put my life on the line for the kingdom of God. These are people who, who believe that God can do more than what we can do. And that God can take our efforts and turn them into supernatural efforts. These are people who have faith. Faith is trusting God when you can't see how it's going to work out. Right? Like faith is believing today what you can only look back on tomorrow to see how it actually happened. But you believed it before it happened. You said yes before you knew the details. These are people who are growing in faith, people empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and when we step into service, you see, we're going to bump up against things that we may not know all the answers to. We may, we may be coming along somebody in, in a situation that we've never been through, and so we don't know how it's all supposed to work out, how it's all going to work out. And in fact, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us don't know that even if we have been in that situation before. Because every situation is different. But people who say, yes, I'm going to step into service and do so with a heart that is full of faith 
Say, you know what? Even though I don't know how it's all going to work out, I trust that God is going to bring good even out of terrible situations because that's what God does. Right? That's what the scripture says, that God brings good even out of the worst of situations. He can transform them by his power and bring salvation and transformation and wholeness and healing. And we need people who believe that who believe that God can do incredibly more than all you can even ask or imagine of him. Who believe that God can still do the impossible because there are people that we're going to encounter that have needs that we're just like, whoa, I don't know what to do with this. But we believe that God can do something wonderful. So we're looking for people who are willing to say, I want to let God grow my faith so that I can believe that he can do more than I can. People who were full of the Spirit. And then lastly, the apostles were looking for people who were full of wisdom. People who were growing in their understanding of God's work in the world. Growing in their understanding of God's ways. Right? What does the scripture say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so people who are full of wisdom, what have they done? They've grown in their understanding of how God moves and works in the world. Are you open to growth in your understanding of how God is moving? Of how God is working? Of how God wants to change people's lives? Are you willing to grow in your understanding of his grace? And your understanding of his mercy? And your understanding of his love? You see, the people that, that the apostles were looking for weren't people that, that came with an attitude of, I've got it all figured out. They were looking for people who were willing to grow and to watch God do something new and wonderful. That's the type of people we're looking for. We're looking for people who are growing in their character, they're letting God transform them. We're looking for people who are growing in their faith. They're, they're believing that God can do the impossible. We're looking for people who are growing in wisdom, their understanding of how God works in the world. And so then the, the logical question is, where might God be calling you to serve? So if... if if you're growing in these areas, like if, if, you're, if you're refusing to grow in these areas, then I would say the step for you today, the thing that I would want you to do today would be to begin to pray and to ask God to make you willing to grow. To transform you into a person who says, God, I'm willing to let you uh, make me willing to change my, my character, my insights. God, I'm willing to, 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 to let you begin to, to build my faith to, to let me believe more. I'm willing to let you show me your power so I understand your working in the world more. Right, like that's, that's our first step is, is us opening ourselves to God's power and work and wisdom in our lives. And saying, God, I'm willing to let you change me so that I can serve others in your power, in your wisdom, in your grace. Are you willing to let God move in you? That's step one. Step two is then asking God, where do you want me to serve? Where do you want me to plug in? The apostles, they, they understood that the ministry of the church was going to suffer if they tried to do everything, right? Like, we saw this in our race this morning. The people who thought they knew everything didn't make it as far as the people who acknowledged they didn't know everything but were willing to work together, right? Like, the team, when we leaned into each other's areas of expertise, we made it further than the people who... I made, you know, they don't believe this, and I don't think anyways, who I made rely only on their own insight and information. And the same is true for us as a church. The apostles understood this. If we only rely on what we can do, on my strength, on my energy, on my experience, on my wisdom, on my faith, 
Like, man, we're not going anywhere as a church. We're stalled. Right? And we have, we have, we have people in, in leadership who, who have high capacity. I'm not saying anything negative about our leadership people. But guess what? It doesn't matter how high a single person's capacity is, if they're the only one that we're expecting to do the work, we're not going to go very far. We're going to stall out, plateau at best, and likely we'll begin to actually decline. The apostles realized this. They said, listen, we can't, we can't run a food program because if we put our efforts and our times into the food program, guess what's going to suffer? The preaching of the word. Prayer for the church. The leadership responsibilities that we have as the apostles. Like all of that, they, they recognize like we need to focus in our lane. We need to run in our lane. And we're going to trust that other people are going to run with us in their lane and together we're going to be able to see God move in miraculous and powerful ways that explode the church in good and healthy ways. Instead of us trying to just do everything and stall out. And so... When we have people who are willing to let God change them on the inside, grow them in character and faith and wisdom, then the next thing is, where is God asking you to plug in? Where is God asking you to grow and to, and to serve? In order to do this, you need to know, like, what's your lane? So when I formed the team this morning, we asked people, who's, who's really good in sewing? Right, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have to ask people who specialize in one area. Like you don't go to a doctor and ask the doctor to do your taxes. Right, you go to an accountant if you have a tax question. You go to the doctor if you have a physical question. That's why the staff laughs at me because sometimes when, when people are sick in the office, I walk over to them. You know, when Elijah was sick this last year, I walked over to him and I said, come over here. Listen to me. I, I said, let me listen to your, your lung, because he was hacking all the time, you know. So I put my ear up to his chest, or to his back, because, you know, it had been weird against his chest, but uh, I put it up against his back, you know, and I listened to his lungs, and I'm like, man, you got bronchitis. Now, he didn't believe me. And, and, and he didn't act on that, which is probably wise, because, like, even though I'm a doctor, I'm not that kind of a doctor, right? Even though I pretend sometimes. He went to somebody who knew how to diagnose his physical symptoms in a healthy way and could actually give him a medication to, to fix the issue. What's your lane? How has God gifted you to serve in the church? What are your spiritual gifts? What are your natural abilities? What are your passions? That's the next question. And so here's, here's the thing. This, this week, I want us to, to focus in on what is, how has God spiritually gifted me to serve? Like, what are the spiritual qualifications or, or, or giftings that God has put naturally into my life that are going to enable me to serve in the church in ways that are like in my lane? And so pull up the church webpage. Pull up the church webpage. Um, if you have your phone or, or your iPad or something, you can pull it up now too if you want. Instead of, you know, stop your game. And, and flip over to the church webpage for a few minutes. So if you look on the church webpage, we put a spiritual gift test on the church webpage. So you'll scroll through and you'll see spiritualgifttest.com. So you just click on that, and up will pop this page, and you scroll down through. You can register if you want, but you can just, we're just going to sign in as a guest. Uh, so we're going to sign in here, and then up will pop this spiritual test, and you can take this, and at the end of it, there's, there's like, It'll take 20 to 40 minutes, depending on how long you want to think about the questions. But ideally, go through the questions just as quick as you can. Like, just first thing that pops into your mind is you're not trying, it's not, uh, you know, you pass or fail. It's, it's trying to identify tendencies and propensities in your life, okay? So uh, once you do that, and, and you can tally your score, and, you, and it'll tell you at the end of the, uh, of the test, uh, 
this is, these are the gifts that you have. These are the, the way that God has wired you to serve in the church. And then I want you to email that to Pastor Jason or to myself, okay? You can email to Pastor Jason. His email is right on the, the first link. It says, be sure to remember to email this to Pastor Jason at opwc.org, right? And so you can just click right on there and email Pastor Jason that. Or if you don't like Pastor Jason, you can email me and I'll email it to Pastor Jason. But uh, um, that's fine too. But uh, I want you to do this because we need you, right? Like, I think sometimes we, we shy away and we think, well, I can't do that as good as Pastor Dan, or I can't do that as good as the worship team does, or, and we kind of only see limited places of service, and we only see people who, who have studied really hard in, in, in particular areas, and we're like, man, I can't do nearly what they can, so we should just rely on them. And No, we need you to run in your lane, to run where God has gifted you, to get involved. Because otherwise, what's going to happen? We're going to have people slip through the cracks. We're going to have people who, who come and their needs aren't being met by the church. And you know what happens when, that, when people experience that reality? They leave. They, they stop coming. They, they go somewhere else, and sometimes they go to places where they're not going to get the word of Jesus. We don't want that to happen because we love every person. And we want you to experience God's grace and his love through his people. And so we need you. We need you to, to know what your lane is, to share that with us. And then we can help you to find opportunities to run in your lane so that together we can see God do here what he did in the book of Acts. Grow the church and develop such a movement of God's power and presence that the whole world was changed. And the same God who did that in the book of Acts is the God that we serve today, and he's still looking for people who will come alongside of him in his work and ministry and change the world today. Will you be one of those people? Will you run in your lane so that together, we can thrive in God's kingdom. Let's pray. God, this morning, thank you for this in, inspiring and, and, and helpful story from the book of Acts that shows us that it's not just about a select few group of people that, that you spent an inordinate amount of time with that are supposed to do everything. No, it's about the church working together. It's about all of us coming and sharing our gifts our talents, our resources, and stepping into those opportunities. Lord, I pray for those this morning who, this, who the first part of the message spoke to, and, and, and they're not yet open to letting you transform them and to make them into people of character and wisdom, and faith. Lord, I pray that you would speak into their lives and that they would take a step to say, Lord, I'm willing to let you make me willing. I'm willing to let you begin to change me on the inside so I can say yes to the opportunities you put in front of me. And Lord, this morning for those who are willing already, who are saying yes, I want Jesus to, to grow my character and my faith, my understanding of how God works in the world. I want to step into those opportunities. Lord, would you would you help them to discover their lane, to understand their giftedness, to be intentional about thinking and then sharing with our leadership their talents and gifts, capacities. And Lord, give our leadership wisdom to know how to release people into service in the kingdom. That your kingdom would grow and that this church would make an impact for the kingdom of God here in Orchard Park, in the surrounding communities, and even in the world. For your glory and grace we pray. Amen. So this is our huddle. So I want you to go out and do something. I want you to take that spiritual gift test this week. But I also want you to be looking for opportunities 
to share with people, to share with other people here in the church, to love on them, to live into their lives. For, for people who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ that God puts into your life this week, would you be looking for opportunities to share his love and grace with them this week? And then invite them back to church with you. Say, hey, you know, this is where I was challenged to grow in this cool relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. And I think you'd be challenged in a positive way there as well. And you'll be loved on by wonderful people. And so take that survey. Let us know how God has wired you so that we can get you plugged into service. If you're already serving, thank you. But let's not let anybody slip through the cracks. Let's be intentional about running in our lane and following God's leading together as a church. Go in peace as you love and live God's grace this week. Amen.